So welcome to the January program of the Antiques Club of the Finger Lakes. Um, my name is Marty Schlabach, and I'll be facilitating the meeting today. But this is just point out, this is our first program of the year. Um, and for those in the in-person audience, uh, there is an attendance sheet circulating. So please sign in for those of you who are here. Uh, we have both remote and in-person attendees today, which is great. Um, just a little sidebar here. I noticed that um, today is the 22nd of January um, of 2022. And I was reminded that in February 22nd, which would be 2-22-22, um, is actually on a Tuesday. So that must be how it's got its name originally. I'd uh, like to thank the Historic Geneva for helping us on this hybrid program. Um, we've had 20 uh, um, some registrations and so we're re for remote access and we've got uh, 1215 here in the audience. I didn't count exactly um, in person, so that's great. And today's program, as you can see, is great graphics helped get the vote. That'll be by Norma Press and Walt Gable. I'll introduce them in a little bit but first, a couple of announcements. Um, we believe this is our 47th year of programming for the Antiques Club. So we have regular programs and events throughout the fall and the spring. And attendance to the programs is free, um, but it is a membership organization, uh, $10 per member per year. And uh, we certainly appreciate all of those who help support the organization. Um, the funds are used to support speakers and also to help to uh, pay for our use of Historic Geneva's space and also for them to help host our online events. Um, if you're in person today, the dues can be collected. Um, today, Josephine is here and she'll be glad to take your money. Otherwise, you can mail her at 273 Kashong Road in Geneva, and she will accept your money that way. Josephine, do you have a treasurer's report today? So in case the remote viewers didn't hear that, the current balance is $796.28. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who are supporting the organization with your dues. So let me just mention a couple of um, upcoming events. Um, the next program is February 26th, again at 2 p.m. on a Saturday, and that's the Antiques Roundtable. Um, look for information about that in your email when we work out the final details. This is an opportunity where um, all of us um, can bring an item or two to share with the rest of the group. Um, if we do it online, which was very successful last year, um, you can submit photos. We'll have a couple of antique dealers here in addition to members to just share information and we can learn about these objects uh, from each other. Um, very quickly, the March program will be John Creamer giving a program on Calvin Coolidge. In April, Mary Jean Welser and I will be giving a talk on 19th century woven coverlets. In May, Denise Richer will be giving a talk on Shaker seed business. All right, let's get on with today. Today's speakers, Norma Press. She's a longtime Antiques Club member and a former club president. She and her husband, Ron, are both collectors. And she's a rug hooker, about which you'll hear more tonight. Walt Gable, Walter Gable, the other speaker, is a longtime Antiques Club member as well. He's also the Seneca County historian. He writes regularly for the Finger Lakes Times. He's authored several books. He has a series of podcasts on Finger Lakes One called Our Finger Lakes History. Both of them are also part of the Antiques Club program committee that put these programs together. So just to remind you again, keep your, your mics on mute and enjoy the program and welcome tonight's speakers. I'm going to make a few comments before uh, turning things over to Norma Press to do the first part. 
Norma and I were planning to do this program back in 2020, which happened to mark the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women suffrage throughout the United States. But of course, uh, some uh, health problems have uh, complicated the, our timeline with regards to that. Because we live here in the Finger Lakes, which is certainly the heart of the birth of the women's rights movement with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Amelia Bloomer and others, uh, we uh, are very familiar with the women's rights movement. I think, but I think you're going to find that this program offers a unique perspective of just how important graphics were in helping women to get the vote. Uh, Norma actually had suggested this program. And so that's why I asked that I wanted to have a chance to say a few things and turn the program over to Norma to do the first part. Um, I am dressed today as a typical suffragist may have, or probably did dress about a hundred years ago, mid-length skirt, um, a white blouse, a, um, what do you call it, a, a sash. Uh, my jewelry are in the colors that I will talk about later. And by the way, Walter was also dressed in suffrage colors um, of gold and blue and his white mask. <laughs> so um, now I'll continue. Um, Okay, um, Walt and I looked at hundreds of items um, that were created by suffragists in the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. Of course, the women's suffrage movement um, was very, very important in Europe and, and in other parts of the world, but we concentrated mostly in the English speaking um, countries. Um, the votes for women message was used on magazines, banners, posters, window signs, just anything you could think of. What's so compelling about these images is that they represent the hopes and dreams of so many women. Some items were simple and homemade, while others were complex and commercially produced. Many showed artistic sensibilities in their design and graphics. Universally, they reflected the daring and determined women who created them. By the way, the term suffragist was used in North America. The term suffragette was first used as a derogatory term, uh, mainly by the media in Great Britain. But lo and behold, the women decided to adopt that word um, themselves. So it could no longer be used as a derogatory term. So here we call women inv involved in the movement suffragists and in Great Britain suffragettes. Go ahead. Uh, this is an example of the women who are all wearing white as well as their sashes in gold. Okay, uh, this is a photo um, is actually originally in black and white and has been, uh, Walter was able to find colorized um, versions of it uh, and notice all the white clothing that they're wearing and the gold. Sassage. The next, please. Um, this is suffragist Margaret Howe in a Washington, D.C. parade in 1913. Uh, this is um, suffragist Hedwig Richter, and she is dressed as Columbia in a parade in Washington, D.C. A lot of her images are in Washington, D.C., which was the center lot of a lot of the um, parades. These are picketers at the White House in 1917, and they were calling upon President Wilson to publicly support women's suffrage. He really hesitated to do that, but eventually uh, his political sense made him support it. Uh, he did so in 1918. 
Here we see a picket parade in Washington in 1917. As we celebrate women's suffrage, I was inspired to hook a series of small rugs or mats based on actual promotional items in the that the suffragists used. My article and rugs were published in Rug Hooking Magazine. During my research, I was surprised to find a connection between women's independence and rug hooking. What is rug hooking? Rug hooking is a basic craft using a hook, a frame with fabric backing stretched over it and fibers such as wool strips that are pulled through the holes in the backing. It was known for many years in England where mill workers were allowed to take home the end of the skein threads and they use those to um, weave with. In North America, the earliest rug hookers are associated with Maine and the Canadian maritime provinces. At first, rug hooking was a way for homemakers to make inexpensive rug coverings and bed coverings. They used old clothing and torn into strips and they hooked it into burlap sacks. Rug hooking also developed as a means for women to earn extra money to help family finances and to gain independence. In several locations, wealthy benefactors and or missionaries helped organize rug hooking communes um, into a profitable cottage industry. These successful ventures helped women earn status and respect in their communities. And that's what they needed. That's what women needed in order to earn the vote. One of the communities which capitalized on the rug hooking skills was Cranberry Island near Northeast Harbor, Maine. The industry was started on a small scale in 1901, supervised by Miss Amy Malley Hicks, who was an artist associated with the arts and crafts movement in New York City. Miss Hicks designed the patterns and gave technical instruction to the women. Some of the best known antique hook rugs come from Canada's maritime provinces, Newfoundland and Labrador. In the early 1900s, the Grenfell mission was established on the northeastern eastern tip of Newfoundland to help the indigenous women capitalize on their weaving skills. And this allowed them to supplement their family's meager income from um, fishing and hunting. The weavers used local motifs to make mats that they sold or traded. The mission run by Dr. Wilfred Grenfell and Miss Jessie Luther arranged to get materials to the weavers and found markets for their products. If you happen to come across any of these rugs, um, they are very collectible. Uh, some, they're, they're usually quite small. Um, and if it's a reasonable price to you, I would say snap it up because they are um, very desirable pieces. As the market for the, uh, for the work grew, the women were able to earn their own living basically and weren't forced to marry just to exist. Some of the talented girls um, who showed artistic ability also earned scholarships to art schools. Today, some women still earn their living from designing and hooking rugs but it's now more popular as a hobby than um, as a means of, means of living. Um, rug hooking groups meet all over this country and Canada in particular. Um, I'm sure there are some all over the world, but I'm mostly familiar with ones in North America. Um, I belong to a rug hooking group that meets in Fairport once a month, and we have a hundred members who come from a radius of about uh, probably 150 miles around Rochester. Today, I'd like to show you some of the suffrage rugs that I interpreted, um, or the suffrage items that I interpreted through rug hooking. My rugs were published in Rug Hooking Magazine in 2019, along with an article on women's suffrage. 
This pennant is from the Manitoba Canada Museum. Um, however, it's not a unique design. Um, women all over uh, US and Canada made these out of felt. This is my version of the same pennant, um, only it's hooked. Um, it was the first suffered drug that I, I hooked. And um, to get that gold color, I dyed beige wool um, using natural dyes such as spices, flowers, mushrooms, and nuts. Um, this particular one, I used turmeric and curries to get the gold color. Um, many rug hookers use natural dyes and many of them also use commercial dyes that are now much more widely available. So here you see the original um, banner and the hook banner on the bottom. This is a 1909 poster advertising the British weekly newspaper Votes for Women published by the Women's Social and Political Union. Notice how pretty and feminine the woman is. The artist who created this uh, was Hilda Dallas, who was a professional artist and a member of the Women's Social and Political Union. This is my version of the same poster. This is an anti-suffrage movement poster. They also use anti-suffrage um, anti people or also used very graphic images, possibly even more graphic than uh, the pro-suffrage people. Um, a favorite technique was to depict suffragists as being ugly and unfeminine. Here's another really ugly woman graphic. This is a bluebird window hanger that was issued by the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. It was part of a 1915 coordinated advertising campaign to pass voting referenda in Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Unfortunately, none of the None of the referendum passed that year. This is my hooked version of the Bluebird window hanger. And I used a grommet to make the um, eye so that I could hang it. This pinback badge was used in the same 1915 Votes for Women campaign. Um, the Kansas sunflower is the likely source of the gold color used by the North American women's suffrage movement. This is my version of the pinback badge. It's eight inches in diameter. Um, those of you um, at home can't see it well, but the central part of the sun is um, raised. And to get that effect, I packed the hooking very close to each other each, each strand, and then I um, clipped it with a, a small scissor in order to get a rounded sun. This is another badge. This represented the National Women's Party, which was formed in 1916 for the main purpose of promoting the suffrage amendment. After that was achieved, this organization continued to advocate for other women's issues including the Equal Rights Amendment, which they are still working on today. This is my hooked version of the same badge. Um, uh, the badge, the original badge was metallic and to simulate the metallic uh, color, I actually painted the gold, the wool that I used um, with gold paint, which not too clear here, but it really is quite effective. Interestingly, Rochester's own Eastman Kodak Company created advertisements to appeal to the growing independence of women, and in doing so, may have also benefited the suffrage movement. Female photographers were featured in their camera ads for decades. 
The Kodak ads showed women traveling around the world, as well as celebrating special times and everyday moments with their families. You can interpret the ad as implying that cameras were easy, was so easy to use that even women can use them. But that wasn't the, that wasn't really the feeling that you got when you when you looked at the pictures. Um, instead, the ads depicted women as adventurous, independent, and intelligent. Here's one of them in front of a pyramid. Taken in front of a pyramid. I like that one. And here's another one. Uh, this would just be an everyday movement, a woman at a beach. Could be Lake Ontario, the way it looks. Uh, could very well be Lake Ontario. And notice um, how feminine the women are um, in the ads, very different from the way the anti-suffragists um, pictured them. Here's another poster. Um, so this woman at the beach is shown working a camera uh, using the newest technology that was available then. But at the same time, she's depicted with a child to show that she is still feminine, even though she knows how to use a camera. And this is my um, rug version of the same poster. After women got the vote, suffragists took on the task of getting women to vote. This was especially true uh, for women who emigrated to the United States from countries where women had few rights. Um, so there were organized uh, efforts to get women to, to register to vote. And this window sign was published by the America's, Americanization Society in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is my rug version of the same poster. This was quite difficult to hook um, because of all the, um, the lettering, which I find very difficult to do. But um, when I was doing the article for Rug Hooking Magazine, I felt it was an important rug to include. So I worked on it on, for many months. This is not a suffrage sign by itself. It is uh, a New York State transportation sign, which some people in this audience may recognize. Um, it marks a very important place in Seneca Falls, the Wesleyan Chapel, where the first convention for women's suffrage was held in 1848. And this is my hooked version of the same sign. Again, I painted the wool with um, a gold color to simulate the original sign, but I think the original sign has now been replaced by one that does not have the doesn't have the metallic color. Many of the items that um, were were made for the suffrage movement um, belong to the Geneva Political Equality Club that was founded on November 30th, 1897 by local women, including Elizabeth Miller and her daughter, Ann Miller, who lived right down the street from the Historic Society. Um, they lived in a home that is now the Lachlan School. They were inspired to help the club after attending the New York State Women's Suffrage Association Convention held in Geneva, November 3rd through 6th, 1897. The Geneva Political Action Club was open to both men and women. It was a forum for discussing events and educating the public on women's rights issues. The Millers were wealthy and influential, and they succeeded in bringing all the well-known suffragists to um, Geneva to speak. The club helped other communities form these form political action groups throughout the state. Okay. And now Walter will continue with a little more about the objects that were used. I hope you've got an appreciation for just clearly how much time 
uh, Norma has spent in preparing those rugs. Uh, so I just admire it greatly. My part of the program focuses on the other many types of graphics that contributed to women getting the vote, be it in various states by a state by state basis, such as New York in 1917, or for the entire nation with the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution in 1919. I am talking about such graphics as posters, postcards, pennants and banners, buttons and pins, other types of jewelry, playing cards, games, pencils and pens, writing paper, letterheads, ribbons, labels, or what were called Cinderella stamps, ceramics, badges, umbrellas, as well as the various print, mag print media, magazines, newspapers, and journals. Much of the colorful and graphic American suffrage memorabilia that survives today was actually manufactured during a relatively short period, but a very productive period of time, roughly 1909 to 1907. Its demise about 1917 was largely the result of the formal entry of the United States into World War I. This peak period of graphics was largely the result of several factors I've shown here. One of these factors is that in the early part of the 20th century, there were significant innovations in printing and manufacturing. So it could be cheap color printing. Another factor was the innovation of celluloid buttons rather than buttons made from nuts. Still another factor, it was the golden age of postcards. The idea of cheap, readily accessible postcards led to everyone using them. Just like people a few years earlier who had gotten a telephone wanted to use it as much as possible. One very special type of postcard that became very popular was the so-called real photo postcard that Norma talked about. I had indicated that the period 1909 to 1917 was the golden age for these graphics, but graph memorabilia actually began appearing much earlier. For example, sheet music dealing with women's suffrage began appearing within one or two years after 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. Another example, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were publishing their newspaper called Revolution soon after the Civil War. After 1890, the National American Woman Suffrage Association was selling cabinet photos of famous suffrage supporters as part of their fundraising efforts. In 1891, Susan B. Anthony's sister Mary started selling a bust made of plaster, a bust of her sister. In the 1880s, Lucretia Mott's son-in-law was selling envelopes with her image imprinted. In 1891, silver souvenir spoons with women's suffrage themes were being sold. Here you see a poster that was used in the 1917 women's suffrage campaign to amend the New York State Constitution to give women in New York State the right to vote. Note how the poster was specifically aimed at Cayuga County. This poster was printed by the National Women's Suffrage Publishing Company. So in this poster, we see how the well-organized national suffrage organization was preparing a poster for just Cayuga County residents. I assume that similar such posters were printed by the same company for virtually all of the counties in New York State, but I haven't so far been able to find 
such a worded poster for any of the other Finger Lakes counties. Here once again, I am thankful to Emily Slocum of Sherwood, New York, who saved all of these posters for her own personal collection. Note also lower right, the union label. Harriet Stanton Blatch, a daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, had been crucial to the women's suffrage movement by bringing in the working women such as the garment workers in New York City who belong to a labor union to support the cause for woman suffrage. The tying of the famous Liberty Bell to a suffrage Liberty Bell is illustrated in this poster. The poster, by the way, is a hand painted poster. It was common to make use of child themes. Oops, gotta go back here. Sorry about that. It was common to make use of child themes in the woman's suffrage posters. To respond to the fears of some that woman's suffrage would lead to chaotic social revolution, Suffrage supporters often used iconic representations of children to deliver their message. Such imagery made suffrage appear both mainstream and non-threatening. At left is a Kellogg's company poster. At right, you see how there were posters that made use of the Revolutionary War theme of no taxation without representation. In April 1917, the United States formally entered World War I, and women's suffrage was seen by many as part of the war effort. Here are posters reflecting that very theme. After all, women were playing major roles here on the home front during the war. This poster was placed on a streetcar. Note once again the union label and that this particular poster once again came from the Holland Stone Store Museum collection of Emily Holland. Here you see the emotionalism on both sides of the upcoming vote in New York State in 1917. Here we have a 1915 poster that had had the year change to be used in the 1917 referendum effort in New York State. The 1915 effort to amend the New York State Constitution was unsuccessful, but apparently many of the 1915 campaign posters were saved and used in the 1917 campaign by simply pasting a seven over the five in the year. Newspapers, political cartoons. Remember the saying, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Newspapers, political cartoons like this one clearly help with the woman suffrage movement. Here you see graphics associated with this Liberty Bell theme. There was an actual suffrage Liberty Bell that was paraded in many cities, as shown at the right. There was a suffrage Liberty Bell pin, lower left, with ribbons. In the middle, there was a suffrage Liberty Bell watch bob for men. Suffragists learned very early in the evolution of the movement about the value of music to inspire and transform. They set suffrage lyrics to popular tunes, generally religious or patriotic in nature, and distributed them on broadsheets and in booklets to be sung at rallies and demonstrations. 
Of course, much of the sheet music was intended more for the parlor in the home rather than for the mass meeting. Printing printed sheet music as opposed to rally broadsides appeared soon after the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, although most of those early pieces were negative in tone. Suffrage sheet music in the 20th century featured a variety of colors and imagery. It was produced by both suffragists themselves as well as by commercial publishers whose efforts tended to focus on ridicule as opposed to support for women's suffrage. Here at the left is the song, She's Good Enough, sung as well as another one at the right, simply titled, Votes for Women. I think you could sense how easy it would be to get a tune into people's heads and they would be hearing it over and over. The anti-suffrage side also made use of sheet music. Here we see some famous images of the flag of the National Women's Suffrage Party. Each time a, flat, a state granted woman suffrage in that state, Alice Paul would sew another star on the flag. A portion of the flag is shown at bottom right, where you see Alice Paul sewing on a star. At left, you see the flag hanging from the second floor balcony of the headquarters of the National Women's Party after Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the proposed 19th Amendment, August 18th, 1920. So the amendment would go into effect. Alice Paul in early 1917 decided that another kind of pressure had to be brought upon President Wilson to get him to change of opposition to woman suffrage. The new tactic Alice Paul developed is shown here. It was picketing for the very first time of the White House. Picketing of the White House for the very first time in our history. In this case, it was picketing in favor of woman suffrage. Note the graphics of the signs. I think you can clearly see how those posters made for great newspaper photos of this picketing. The picketers became known as silent sentinels. And starting in mid-June of that year, many of these silent sentinels were arrested for disturbing the peace or blocking the flow of people on the sidewalk. They had the option to pay a fine or be jailed, and they chose to be jailed. Here is the pin given to those who were the silent sentinels who were arrested and jailed. Here, once again, we see how cleverly Alice Paul used every opportunity to have some kind of graphic to promote the woman suffrage effort. On October 27th of 1917, Alice Paul herself was arrested when she was carrying a banner that quoted President Wilson's comment, quote, the time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there can be but one choice. We have made it. She was sentenced to seven months in prison placed in solitary confinement at Ocoquan Workhouse for two weeks with nothing to eat but bread and water, she became weak and unable to walk. So she was then taken to the prison hospital. She began there a hunger strike and the other imprisoned suffragists joined her. 
Then they were being force fed by doctors putting tubes down their throats. If that wasn't bad enough, on the night of November 14th, 1917, known as the Night of Terror, nearly 40 prison guards brutalized these suffragists. Newspaper stories aroused public opinion. On November 27 and 28, all of the imprisoned suffragists were released, including Alice Paul, who had only spent five weeks of her seventh month term. Once again, here you see a jailed for freedom pin that was given to those who were arrested while working for women's suffrage and went on a hunger strike while in prison. Alice Paul cleverly never passed up this opportunity for still another emotional appeal for woman suffrage. This medal is based on the one that England's Emmeline Pankhurst developed in 1909 hunger strikes in England. Banners were important and you can imagine the emotional impact of this campaign banner. New York State denies the vote to criminals, lunatics, idiots, and women. This was in a New York City parade. But there are many other graphics. One of these pins. I have several reproduction examples shown here. Jewelry was another kind of graphic. The sale of such jewelry was a means of fundraising for women suffrage groups to continue their campaigns. Sashes, such as the one Norma has been wearing, were a widespread symbol of the suffrage movement, particularly during the time of mass parades and demonstrations from 1910 to 1915. Draped around the shoulder, extending down to the waist, often worn in conjunction with a parade uniform, sash was a strong visual statement to the onlooker of the intensity of devotion to the woman suffrage movement. Sashes could be easily worn whenever a suffragist wished to identify with the women's suffrage movement. The first president, the first penance, excuse me, used in presidential campaigns appeared just after the turn of the century in 1900 and felt penance supporting suffrage appeared soon after. Most were nondescript, containing simply the phrase, vote for women in black letters, set against a yellow background. The three here are slightly more elaborate, with the top piece showing Ella Buchanan's famous image of the suffragists around her sisters, and the bottom pennant in a different color scheme, borrowing Carolyn Watts' bugler girl design from England. The letter WSP in the middle one stands for Women Suffrage Party. There were badges and ribbons, especially as delegates to women's suffrage organizations and meetings. Although printed ribbons appeared in political campaigns as early as the first quarter of the 19th century, it would take more than 50 years before any type of corresponding suffrage ribbon was to emerge on the scene. The idea of the yellow ribbon first used in Kansas became used nationwide. Cinderella stamps, as they become, became known, were non-philatelic stamps. In other words, not for the actual postage due on an envelope. They were used to advertise and advance the cause of suffrage. 
These labels or Cinderella stamps were very popular among the super suffragists who placed them on letters, postcards, convention programs, and even on luggage. Suffrage fans, generally flat and made out of cardboard, were an especially popular form of memorabilia, particularly in those hot summer days that preceded air conditioning. They were a highly welcomed giveaway at ball games, picnics, horse races, and other outdoor, acti outdoor activities, even for those who did not otherwise support the suffrage movement. Fly swatters. The top one was passed out during the 1915 suffrage campaign in New Jersey. The writing on the handle is, quote, swat the fly, give women the vote, and be happy, unquote. The other side more seriously reads, quote, remember to vote on October 19th for a square deal for New Jersey women, unquote. That referendum on that date did not pass in New Jersey. Similarly, on election day in November 1915, Male voters in the neighboring states of Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and New York also defeated their state women's suffrage referendum. Other varieties of fly swatters sold by the National American Women's Suffrage Association carried the slogan, quote, swat the flies and save the baby, or simply vote for women. These were sold for 25 cents apiece another way to raise money for the women's suffrage movement. There were suffrage umbrellas. The one at right was distributed nationally by the National American Women's Suffrage Association and sold for a dollar each and $10 for a dozen. The particular example shown has the name of the state of Idaho printed on it. Time that Idaho apparently was voting on a state referendum for woman suffrage. The almanac at left appeared in 1858. Suffrage cookbooks, such as what was at right, were more widespread here in the U.S. than in England. The first suffrage cookbook appeared in 1886. The Washington State Equal Suffrage Association sold 3,000 copies of its Washington Women's Cookbook in the 1910 suffrage effort. Recipes from this cookbook were a special feature of the Votes for Women grocery store that was opened up in New York City in 1913. Women suffrage calendars began appearing in the 1880s. The middle one consisted of tear-off postcards. The one at right is in the Art Nouveau style. Here a company marketing face powder with the lid advocating votes for women. As the caption states, manufacturers began using famous activists to in effect endorse their products when they probably didn't formally endorse the product. In this case, we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton appearing to endorse this fairy soap. Business cards for businesses that supported women's suffrage. Top left, it's shoe it's stove polish, middle top, shoe polish, bottom right, smoking tobacco. Advertising trade cards were very popular at this time. This one is for a business who owner apparently was an anti-suffragist. On this non-business side of the trade card, you see a satire of Dr. Mary Edwards Walker of Oswego, the only woman ever to have been awarded the Medal of Honor. 
She is being satirically shown because of the style of clothing she wore instead of a dress. The tin thread holder was named after Sarah Bagley, an early labor activist in Lowell, Massachusetts. Although she left Lowell in 1848 to take care of an ill father, her efforts on behalf of women workers were still remembered in 1915 when this particular piece was made. State headquarters in Massachusetts awarded $500 in prize money to be divided among the top 17 women who had achieved most in terms of their sale of these thread holders. Profits were divided equally between the state organization and local affiliates. Small bisque and porcelain figures and statues with suffrage themes were quite common both in England and the United States. Most ceramic figures dealing with suffrage themes were made in Germany, especially by the firm, the firm of Schaefer and Wagner. So I think you can understand that when we enter the war against Germany in 1917, this is gonna to come to an end buying things from Germany. They became very collectible items for the, in, for the home to be placed in a cabinet or on a wall shelf. Notice at top right, the whiskey flask. It depicts Teddy Roosevelt dressed as a suffragist. Norma has shown this tin bird. It was one foot long and it was nailed in various places. It was also made into a pin, a smaller sized pin. Many women suffrage activists made use of Christmas cards and Valentines with pro-woman suffrage messages. Here we see a handkerchief embroidered for women's suffrage. Bottom right, we have a paper napkin with a woman suffrage theme. Suffragists sold a variety of playing cards, both in England and the United States, insisting, however, that they not be purchased for gambling. There were several board games with women's suffrage themes. The one shown at bottom left demonstrates the obstacles women faced in obtaining their vote. At top left, the player pieces are markers of another board game. At top right is an English puzzle with the woman's suffrage theme. At bottom right, we have a jack-in-the-box man with his vote for women sassy when he jumps up out of the box. This china was ordered by Newport, Rhode Island socialite Mrs. Elva Vanderbilt Belmont from the English firm of John Maddock and Sons for use in the lunchroom that Mrs. Belmont established at the headquarters of the Political Equality Association in New York City. That small restaurant was intended specifically for working class girls. Certain pieces of the set could be purchased there such as the creamer, which sold at the time for 25 cents. They made their appearance again in 1914 at a large celebration at Mrs. Belmont's Marble House Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island. They were being used when her daughter, the Duchess of Marlborough, was returning from England for a visit. Other suffrage china was distributed in America but pieces from this set are by far the most widely seen today. If you go to Marble House in Newport or the other mansions uh, such as the Breakers gift shop, you can buy these China pieces. Perhaps the most famous 
or most popular form of memorabilia among suffragists was that of the postcard. And here I show two examples. Suffrage associations announced new cards in their journal and papers. They printed and published their own varieties of postcards. And if they operated a suffrage shop of any sort, they were sure to have a supply available for sale. Commercial publishers also took note, printing many more examples than even the suffragists did. Although many of the images of the commercial publishers were often negative. Suffragists took note of these commercial products in their newspapers if the images were positive ones and many even collected them. One of the most popular types of postcard was that of the real photo that Noma, Norma excuse me, talked about. Here is an example of a postcard showing how the idea of women's suffrage was to spread from the West to the states east of the Mississippi River. New York State in 1917 is the first state east of the Mississippi to actually grant woman suffrage in the state. Various journals and magazines used graphics, especially on their covers, to promote women's suffrage. Here you see Leslie's magazine. Life magazine would be another example. Various women's magazines would be other examples. Although I'm not going to dwell on this, I want to point out that the anti-suffrage movement also made extensive use of graphics. In early September 1920, I found this quote in, an, in this article uh, online, and I think it summarizes well just how very important graphics were to helping women to get the right to vote. I've highlighted in red a sentence that I think is particularly strong summary. There is perhaps no better example of the arts being used to help transform public opinion in a social or political manner than during the women's suffrage movement today than the women's suffrage movement, excuse me. Today, in our more social media era, it would probably be TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and so on like that. So I leave you with one thought. Great graphics helped women get the vote, but the vote has to be exercised. I think we're available for questions and Marty's going to lead us for that. Okay, good. I would have gone. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you very much, Norma. And now some time for questions. You can put them in the chat. Um, I think we have a small enough group. If you had a, a comment or a question that doesn't fit in the chat very well, you can un, un, uh, unmute at some point and raise that. Um, so the first question is, how long did it take to hook those rugs? They are so impressive. So why don't you pull your chair up a little closer here. Year period. Um, I started with one and just added another and another and another, but um, they took anywhere from one month to several months to hook, to hook each rug, depending upon uh, how complicated they are. Some of the rugs um, we didn't show, some of the more complicated ones. I don't know if we can show them now. Um, they're on the screen. I'd have to hold them up, I think, if I wanted to show oh, them. Oh, you want to see? Let me try I'm that. Gonna, I'm going to grab um, Regine. 
Yeah, that was one of them. And then that other one, the uh, 100, 100 years. I don't know if I can. Uh, this says, a woman's place is everywhere. And this, this is from a poster at the Women's Rights um, Historical National Historical Park in Seneca Falls. And it's their, po oh, their poster in a hooked version. So these, these uh, took a little more time, maybe three months. Looks like the camera is in uh, mirror mode, so that was reversed. Okay. All right. Um, another question. The first one was uh, from Doug and Ariane. This one is from Doug, a different Doug, Doug Fisher. Would you clarify the different usages of the spelling of the phrases women's suffrage or women's suffrage, woman or women? This is a interesting historical question. Uh, the uh, marker for the first women's con rights convention uh, that uh, was stands there near the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls that you saw earlier in the program and Norma did a hooked rug of it. I had a park ranger <laughs> say to me uh, two years ago now, oh, but they misspelled it because they it's w-o-m-a-n apostrophe s and i said to the park ranger no my understanding from uh uh and rossi when she was the a historian there at the women's rights national historic park that until about 1900 they tended to use w-o-m-a-n apostrophe s women's rights they used that and then Sometime in the 1900s, it was changed to W-O-M-E-N apostrophe S. And so there is that common distinction. If that's the clarification that is being sought in the, uh, in the question. Uh, so if it's before 1900, it's A. If it's after 1900, it tends to be E. Do you want to explain that in your section? Yeah, I don't, I probably won't be able to find it, but um, one of the anti suffrage techniques was to depict women who wanted suffrage as the, the, the fringe society, ugly, single, unmarried, no children, just any negative connotation that society had about women was how they were de depicted. Um, whereas the mainstream, really, uh, suffrage was a mainstream idea, or I have to say, probably supported by wealthy women to start with, but then uh, the working women wholeheartedly uh, supported the movement. So it was just a negative connotations. Yeah. Yes. If you want, after we get done with all of this, I'll go back to that frame and project it so you can take a much more timely look at it. But you have to remember it, giving women the right to vote in a state required men to vote, to give women the right to vote. When it came to adoption or ratification of the 19th Amendment, you need to remember that in many of the states that were going to give women the right to vote, it once again was an all male state legislature. So uh, it took, it was a Herculean task to, <laughs> turn that anti-suffragist sentiment, at least a majority of the men, to be supportive of women's suffrage. Uh, it was also the Western states that granted suffrage to women much earlier than um, the Northeastern states and the Northeastern states much earlier than the Southern states.
Any idea? Um, well, white was considered purity. Um, now I've got, I've got to find my list. Um, let's see if I can, if I can, if I can find my, my list, I'll These are there. my page. Yeah, but right. go ahead. They might be you. Just can't no, think no, of you, it. So yours. Yeah. I'm going to have to look that up as, the, as we're the, talking. The yellow Kansas sunflower, but also okay. Elizabeth Cady Stanton published a lot of articles in Amelia Bloomer's uh, The Lily publication anonymously by the name Sunflower. Okay, um, gold um, symbolized life. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. Uh, purple was loyalty and the colors white, gold, and purple were used in North America. Purple was not used in um, Great Britain. They use some of the, some of the groups used um, green and that was supposed to symbolize hope. And those were, I think possibly, those were also um, easy colors to certainly white and gold. All of the women would have something that was white or yellow or gold. Um, so that was probably one of the reasons that th that was chosen. Oh, okay. We will. Okay. Are, is there another question from the audience in person? Okay, we'll move on to a couple more chat questions. This looks like a big one. Historically. Which, use, which usages were used by whom and when over the time span of the movement were they used? So. This related to my earlier question about women's versus women's. Oh, women versus women. Okay. So I would do you feel, do you feel, do you feel like the question was answered then or? Well, originally, as uh, Walter said, woman was, it was used as singular, a woman's right to vote. And then it just, they started using it in the plural. And that it's pre and post 1900. Yeah. Great. Um, Norma and Walt, thank you for watching the program. Norma, your rugs are truly works of art. Love that you carry them and that you dress the part. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That looks like all the questions that have come in on chat. Um, are there any other questions either in either audience? Well, thank you very much, Walt. And thank you very much, Norma, for this great talk. And um, I also wanna thank the program committee for helping to put these programs together, it's a group effort in organizing this. And thanks to Historic Geneva for hosting our sessions. And this will be available at all, you think? Yes. So the plan is that this, this program has been recorded and we'll send out an email with the link to that once that is in place. So thanks to all of you who attended, whether in person or online and have a good evening.